tonight, stocks plummet. The worst day on Wall Street in six years as one of Wall Street's largest investment firms goes bankrupt and another is bought out. That was five years ago today when Lehman Brothers collapsed, sparking the worst financial crisis since the Depression. Five years later, most Americans aren't convinced that we've recovered from it. And I challenge the president with that concern. Five years out, let's take stock. You know, I'm looking at the cover of Time magazine this week. It says how Wall Street won. And we've got polls showing that, you know, two thirds of the country still think we're going in the wrong direction, think the economy is no more secure. What do you say to those Americans who think Wall Street is winning, but they're not? Well, let's think about where we were five years ago. Um, the economy was on the verge of a Great Depression. Uh, in some ways, actually, the economic data and uh, the collapse of the economy was worse than what happened uh, in the 1930s. And we came in, stabilized the situation. We've now had 42 straight months of growth, 7.5 million new jobs created, 500,000 jobs in manufacturing, 370,000 jobs in an auto industry that uh, had completely collapsed. Uh, the banking system works. It is giving loans to companies who can get credit. And so we have seen, I think, undoubtedly, progress across the board. The housing market uh, has recovered. But what is also true is we're not near where we need to be. And uh, part of it has to do with a whole bunch of long-term trends in the economy where uh, the gains that we've made in, in productivity and people working harder have all accrued to the people at the very top. 95% of the gains to the top 1%. Yeah. That is so striking. It, it is. And the folks uh, at, uh, in the middle and at the bottom haven't seen uh, wage or uh, income growth, not just over the last three, four years, but over the last 15 years. And so everything that I've done has been designed to, number one, stabilize the economy, get it growing again, start producing jobs again. Number two, trying to push against these trends that have been happening for decades now. That's why we made sure that we had a tax system that was a little bit fair by asking people to uh, pay more at the top. That's what the Affordable Care Act uh, health care reform is about, is making sure that folks who uh, have been left out in the cold when it comes to health care are able to get health care. Uh, that's why we strengthened the entire banking system so that you know, too big to fail is far less likely to be in place uh, if, heaven forbid, there's a crisis the next time. Because we've said, you know, banks, you've got to double the amount of capital that you have so that you can absorb losses when you have them, so taxpayers aren't bailing you out. If you do uh, start going under, uh, you've got to have a plan, uh, a living will, we call it, so that we don't have to come in and clean up after you. You're going to be on your own. Okay, but you do all these things yeah. and still 95% of the gains go to the right. top 1%. Do you look at that four and a half years in and say, Maybe a president just can't stop this accelerating inequality. No, I think, I think the president can stop it. I, the problem is that uh, there continues to be a major debate here in Washington, and that is how do we respond to these underlying trends? If you look at, at, at the data, a couple of things are, are, are creating these trends. Number one, globalization, right? Capital, companies, they can move businesses and, and jobs uh, anywhere they want. And so they're looking for the lowest wages. That squeezes workers here in the United States, even if corporations are profitable. Technology. If you go to uh, a lot of companies now, they've eliminated entire occupations because they're now robotized. You know, we don't have travel agents. We don't have bank tellers. It's bigger than Washington. Right. So, so there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening in the marketplace. But if we have policies that make sure that uh, our kids are prepared for higher skilled jobs. If we have policies that make sure that we're rebuilding our infrastructure, because a robot can't uh, build a road, uh, and we need uh, you know, new ports and a smarter electricity grid. If we're making investments uh, to make sure that uh, research and development continues to happen here. If we have uh, tax breaks for companies that are investing here in the United States as opposed to overseas. All those things can make the situation better. It doesn't solve the problem entirely, but it pushes against these trends. And the problem that we've got right now is you've got a portion of uh, Congress who, whose policies don't just uh, want to uh, 
you know, leave things alone. They actually want to accelerate these trends. There's no serious economist out there that would suggest that if you took the Republican agenda of slashing education further, slashing Medicare further, slashing research and development further, slashing investments in infrastructure further, that that would reverse some of these trends but of the inequality. The stalemate may lead to something uh, even more disastrous. It's deja vu all over again here in Washington. You're a couple weeks away from a government shutdown, a few weeks away from a possible default one more time. Okay. Speaker Boehner says, listen, you just have to sit down morning, and negotiate with me. Are you still absolutely refusing to talk in any way, shape, or form? No, no, no. Keep in mind uh, my position here, George, because I have been through this a couple of times with Speaker Boehner. Uh, what, I'm, what I've said is, with respect to the budget, We've presented our budget, Thank you, everybody. and now it's the job of Congress to come up with a budget that keeps our long-term trends down of, or, or our current trends of, of reducing the deficit moving forward, but also allows us to invest in the things that we need to grow. And I've told him, and I've told the country what I think we need to do. I'm happy to have a conversation with him about how we can deal with the so-called sequester, which is making across the board cuts on stuff that we shouldn't be cutting, while continuing tax breaks, for example, for companies that are not helping to grow the economy. There are ways of doing this, it's just that they haven't been willing to negotiate in a serious way on that. What I haven't been willing to negotiate, and I will not negotiate, is on the debt ceiling. The presidents this, have done that in the past, and you've done it in the past. No, 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 no. George, if you take a look, what has never happened in the past was the notion that uh, in exchange for fulfilling the full faith and credit of the United States, that we are wiping away, uh, let's say, major legislation like the health care bill. So you're that's, not open to any changes in Obamacare. That's never happened before. And when it comes to budgets, we've never had a situation in which a party said that, uh, you know, unless we get our way 100 percent, then uh, we're going to let the United States default. That's never happened, George. That didn't happen uh, when you were working here in the White House. But there House. were reforms added to the debt limit uh, legislation. The, George, I think it's fair to say uh, you, that never in history have we used just making sure that the U.S. government is paying its bills as a lever to radically cut the government at the kind of scale that they're talking about. It's never happened before. There have been negotiations around the corners because nobody had ever presumed that you'd actually threaten the United so States to default. So how does this end then? You know, they say they need changes in Obamacare. You say you're not going to negotiate. Are you just betting they're going to cave? No, no, George, here's the problem. The, the, uh, if, we set, if we continue to set a precedent in which a president, any president, a Republican president, a Democratic president, uh, where the opposing party controls the House of Representatives, uh, if, if that president is in a situation in which each time the United States is called upon to pay its bills, uh, the other party can simply sit there and say, well, we're not going to pay the bills unless you give us what, our, what we want. That changes the constitutional structure of this government entirely. So you're not going to negotiate? So we, so, so, so we can't negotiate around the debt ceiling. If Mr. Boehner has ideas about uh, how we can grow this economy, strengthen the middle class, put people back to work in a serious way, uh, of course we're happy to uh, you know, support the negotiations that are taking place between uh, the House and the Senate. If we're going to continue to reduce the deficit, and I think a lot of people aren't aware of the fact that the deficit's been cut in half since I came into office, it's continuing on a trend line of further reductions. If we want to do more deficit reduction, I've already put out a budget that says, let's do it. I'm willing to reform entitlements. I'm willing to you know, cut out additional waste that may be there. But I, I, what I also think we should be doing is eliminating uh, corporate tax breaks that nobody can defend, uh, but keep on a reappearing each year in the budget. Um, if we are serious about it, there's no reason uh, that we can't do it and do right by, uh, how about, by, the, by the country. How about beyond the deficit? You were yeah. you know, re-elected a little more than a year ago, yeah. 332 electoral votes, 51% yeah. of the vote, first yeah. president since Eisenhower, yeah. to do it twice. You put gun control at the top of the agenda, immigration reform, climate change, all of it stalled or reversing. 
How do you answer the argument that beyond the deficit, mm -hmm. this has been a lost year, and how do you save it? Well, uh, on immigration form, uh, for example, uh, we got a terrific bipartisan vote out of the Senate. You had Democrats and Republicans in the Senate come together, come up with a bill that wasn't perfect, it wasn't my bill, but got the job done. It's now sitting there in the House. Not going anywhere. Well, but what I will say is this. If Speaker Boehner put that bill on the floor of the House of Representatives right now, it would pass. It would pass. So the question then is not whether or not uh, uh, the ideas that we put forward can garner a majority of support, certainly in the country. I mean, gun control, we had 80, 90 percent of the country that, that agreed with it. The problem we have is we have a, a, a faction of the Republican Party, uh, in the House of Representatives in particular, that view compromise as a dirty word, and anything that is even remotely associated with me, they feel obliged to oppose. And my argument to them is real simple. That's not why the people sent you here. We're out of time. Final question. Uh, your vice president is at Tom Harkin Steak Fry in Iowa yeah. this weekend. Clearly, Secretary Clinton positioning for a possible run for president, too. You chose both of them. What do you say to your fellow Democrats when they're thinking about that possible choice? And are you determined to stay neutral throughout this whole process? Uh, what I would say to uh, folks out there is we are tremendously lucky to have uh, an incredible former Secretary of State. Uh, who couldn't have served me better, and an incredible vice president who couldn't, uh, who couldn't be serving me better. And I suspect if you ask both of them, they'd say it's way pre too uh, premature to start talking about uh, well, he's in 2016. Iowa. Well, he, I, you know, I was a, a big state and he's an old friend of Tom Harkins. So you're staying completely neutral? Uh, listen, I, I think, uh, as you pointed out, I just got reelected last year. Uh, my focus is on the American people right now. I'll let you guys. Uh, uh, worry about the politics. Mr. President, thanks very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you, George.